Test one, two. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel of Hilo. Welcome. This morning I'm reading from Psalm 89, verses 1 to 13. I will sing of the loving kindness of the Lord forever. To all generations I will make known your faithfulness with my mouth. For you have said, loving kindness will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your feet forever and build up your throne to all generations. The heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness also in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the sky is comparable to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty is like the Lord? A God greatly feared in the, in the councils of the holy ones and awesome above all those who are around him. O Lord God, our hosts, who is like you, O mighty Lord? Your faithfulness also surrounds you. You rule the swelling of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. You yourself crushed Rahab like one who is slain. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours, the earth also is yours, the world and all it contains, you have founded them. The north and the south, you have created them. Tabor and Hermon, shout for joy at your name. You have a strong arm, your hand is mighty, your right hand is exalted. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Loving kindness and truth go before you, and blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. O oh Lord, they walk in the light of your countenance. In your name they rejoice all the day, and by your righteousness they are exalted. For you are the glory of their strength, and by your favor our horn is exalted. Please join us in prayer. Our dearest Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and the privilege to be able to worship in in truth and in life and we ask you to be with us and guide us you know each and every one of us here today and those who are listening individually you know us you know us our needs our desires our hopes our failures you know all about us lord we ask you to work in our lives to continue to make us more like your son jesus christ we ask you to bless this service in jesus name we pray amen
It was finished upon the cross. Death once was my great opponent. Fear once had a hold on me. But the Son who died to save us rose that we would be free indeed. Death was once the great opponent. Fear once had a hold on me. But the Son who died to save us rose that we would be free indeed. Yes, He rose that we would be free indeed. Free from every plan of darkness, free to live and free to love. Death is dead and Christ is risen. It was finished upon the cross. Onward to eternal glory. Hallelujah. To my Savior and my God, I rejoice in Jesus' victory. It was finished upon the cross. It was finished upon the cross. Yes, it was finished upon the cross. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord, that's our hope. We thank you and praise you, Lord, and worship you, Lord. Open our hearts to you. Thank you.
Let the nation sing it louder Cause nothing has the power to say But your name Got a new song for me, so for all of us. So. I believe you gave sight to the blind. I believe that the dead came to life. I believe there were wonders inside. You're still the same. I believe every word that you said I believe there are scars in your hand That your goodness is good without end And you'll never change I will tell of your wonders Sing of your grace The God of creation knows me by name the Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always, always. Your mercy is mighty, age after age, and all generations will bow down and praise. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always, always. I believe you will come. I believe you are here even now In your presence I know there is power The power to save I will tell of your wonders Sing of your grace The God of creation knows me by name The Lord is faithful Yesterday, now, and always, always. Your mercy is mighty, age after age, and all generations will bow down and praise. The Lord is faithful, yesterday, now, and always, always. Yes, you were, you are, you always will be God. Yes, you always will be God. I will tell of your wonders, sing of your grace. The God of creation knows me by name. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always. Always, your mercy is mighty, age after age, and all generations will bow down and praise. The Lord is faithful, yesterday, now, and always, always. I will tell of your wonders, sing of your grace. The God of creation knows me by name. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.
Aleluia. Not like tech savvy, so I got paper still, so. Choose this day whom you will serve. And 
As for me and my house, we will serve you, Lord. We will serve you, Lord. We will not bow to the gods of men. We will not bow to the gods of men. We'll worship the God of Israel. We will not bow to the gods of men. We will not bow to the gods of men. We worship the God of Israel. For me and my house, we will serve you, Lord. Lifting holy hands in worship. We will not bow down to the gods of men. We will worship the God of Israel. Yes, we will. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your love. We just want to sing about your love, Lord. In moments like these, I sing out a song. I sing out a love song to Jesus In moments like these I lift up my hands I lift up my hands to the Lord Singing I love you Lord Singing Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Because you first loved us. Thank you, Lord, for dying for us, Lord. We pray, Lord, let your word get into us. And we pray for the message, Lord, that we hear your message loud and clear. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Everyone say aloha to each other.
as the kids settle down and go into their classes, um, it's going to be some changing. We've, we've got a class that's in the back right now, and they're going to switch next week. You'll know. We just got it uncarpeted for the little ones, and we'll be working over here and working over there little by time. And um, it's good to see people here. You know, for a long time, we didn't see as many people, and, yes. and it's, it's nice to worship together. Do you agree? Yes. Yeah. Can you imagine what it's going to be like in heaven? Ooh. Anyone ever been to a Harvest Crusade or a Billy Graham Crusade? Okay, for those that have, what about a, a, a football game? You know, the, the bleachers are just rocking like this, you know, when everybody's doing their wave and everything. It's going to be much more than that in heaven. I guess I'm pumping you up today because the, the subject that we're going to be looking at today is a difficult subject. For those that are visiting, you're jumping right in the middle of the worst chapter in the Bible, the darkest chapter, because we're in the book of Revelation. We've got about nine more weeks in it. And I want to take you back. It's not on the screen. I didn't tell the gal in the back. But Revelation chapter 3, verse Ver, or cha- Revelation 1, verse 3. Let me read. It says, Blessed is he who reads. Those who hear the words of this prophecy and heed the things written in it, for the time is near. Thank you, Lauren. You are quick. <laughs> and this is a key verse in understanding the book of Revelation. The early church was meant to read aloud. They didn't have their iPads, their phones, even Bibles. So as to be read loud. So it says again, blessed is the the one who reads. As I read this, I'm blessed. As you're home reading this, you are blessed. Because if you continue through it, you will have an understanding little by little, more and more. And it says, blessed is the one who hears. That's you. And if you're at home, read it aloud and that you hear it. This is very, very, very important. Because you're, you're getting two senses. You're reading with your mind. You're also you're listening with your ears. You're going to retain it. It's very important you retain it, especially when you get to this chapter. I'll explain that in a second. And then it goes on, and heed the things that are written in it. And the reason I bring this up is because this book is meant to be read aloud. It's meant to be heard with our hearts and our minds. And there's an application for it. I say that because there are many people that believe that, well, this is just a story of good and evil. It's more than that. And we're going to see that today. With that said, let me open in prayer. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you again, as I pray regularly, that we're still in a country where we can read the word aloud. We can hear and we can study. We can encourage one another, build one another up, and pray for one another. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you have gone to the cross and died upon the cross and were raised upon that third day. Father, today we pray that you will bless your word. And as you bless your people here, Lord, I pray today when they go out that they will be a blessing wherever they go bringing the truth, the truth that will set people free. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Revelation is a very understandable book once someone's taking you through it the first time. It doesn't mean that we're going to understand everything But what we need to understand more than anything else is God is a God of love. Not God of love of the world. God loves everyone. He does. He sent his only begotten son. Whosoever believe in him will not perish and have everlasting life. That belief is trust and rest in him. But some have gone too far and they say that everyone in this world will be saved. But that's not what the Bible teaches I have friends that have rejected Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Unless they receive him before that day, they close their eyes in this world. They will go into a Christless eternity. 
And we're going to see that final judgment today, and next week will be the consequences of that, how the world is going to be affected in a big time. Not everyone will be saved. The Bible teaches from cover to cover, only a remnant will be saved. Let me ask you, are you that remnant, part of that remnant? Now, Jesus speaking, he says, the gate is narrow that leads to life. Broad and wide leads to destruction. The gate is narrow that leads to life, and few find it. It's a total different thinking than the world. And they're blinded by the God of this world, and this chapter should break your heart like never before when you look at your family, when you look at your friends, your coworkers, what will you do with this knowledge? Now, you and I don't need to fear if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Why? Because perfect love casts out all fear. No matter what you're going through, God is a God of all comfort. He'll bring you comfort and peace not as the world will bring, but he'll give you a peace that passeth all understanding. Is that okay with you? Yes. Guess not. It should be yes. I mean, it should, thank you, Lord. And this is going to tell you where you are in your walk, whether you're excited or not. I know you're not as intense, intense as me. But this is an intense moment when you think about these things. Let me read just for a second one more thing. And I think the worship did just fine, but I want to bring just a few more verses. And I'm going to read from Psalm 92. It says, It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, Most High, to declare your loving kindness. Or mercies is another way of saying it in the morning. In your faithfulness at night, and with the ten string lute, and with the harp, and with the resounding music upon the lyre, for you, O Lord, have made me glad by what you have done, and I will sing for the joy of the works of your hands. This is a life that should be for you and me. And what I mean by that is if you have that right attitude and you're focused upon the author and the finisher of your faith, when you come to difficult passages, that's what's going to carry you through the scripture. Knowing that he is a God of love and looking what he's done and remembering what he's done. When we do communion, and we'll do communion next week, it's a reminder what he's done. What has he done for you? How often do you stop and say, Lord, I love you. We can confess our sins. We can tell them all over once, but do you just stop and tell them you love them? You know what I love? I love it when my wife says, I love you, and she calls me amor. Don't you like to hear that too? How much more your heavenly father who is love. And when we come to the word, if we, if we start the day in this way, whether you're listening to YouTube, whatever it means you have, start with the worship and focusing on the greatness of God and thinking how he sustained you and kept you through every situation. He must have you here. And he will. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Well, I've titled this message is Seven Bowls of Wrath. It's Revelation chapter 16, verses 1 through 21. I encourage you to open your Bibles and look. Every cross-reference for those that are visiting to will go up on the screens, and you'll be able to follow it, not have to flip over there real quick. I'm reading from the New American Standard. Now, Revelation 16 is not only the darkest chapter in the book of Revelation. It is the darkest chapter in the whole Bible. Congratulations for being here. But it's important to understand God is a just God, a righteous God, and because he's holy, he must judge 
sin. Because sin will not be in heaven. He must put an end to the sinful world and the devil and all of those that follow him. And that's kind of what this chapter is about. And it's come to this point that judgment is no longer delayed. It's coming. Now, many of us at different points in our life say, Lord, get them now. We want to get even with them. But as you grow in the love and grace of Jesus Christ, you'll you'll say, just like Jesus did from the cross, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And you're going to begin praying that their hearts would be open, their lives would be changed. That's what God is changing in you and me. Or I think of Paul, who is willing, if it was possible, to give up his salvation for the, the nation of Israel. If they'd only confess and repent and turn back. Love, the mark of a Christian. But love must deal with sin. God's going to pour out these bowls of wrath. They'll be more intense than anything that you and I have seen in the book of Revelation, more intense than anything in this world that has ever happened. Again, we're not talking about the oppression of Again, uh, Napoleon, the persecution of the the Roman popes, Hitler's monstrosities, the things that he did. Worse than anything that you and I could ever imagine, and certainly I don't want to imagine. The chapter centers around seven plagues, and they're poured out. It's God's wrath against the unrepentant, Sinner. He simply says, God, I'm going to do it my way. I can be good enough. I can save myself. The world now is being prepared many, many ways. The one that I want to call your attention to is, is simply this. If you look at whether it be a, a movie, at the, at the movies or Netflix or whatever you choose to watch, we have these superheroes And the world is looking for a superhero to save them from what? God. Because they like darkness more than light. That's why they continue in their sin, habitually continue. These things will come so rapidly once they do begin, it'll be like a machine gun. I wonder how that's going to sound on the radio. But anyways, that idea, you shoot a gun, one bullet here, one bullet here, it's going to be rapid fire, every one of those events. If you're watching a a movie, sometimes those events are flashing so fast, so horrible. It's nothing compared to what's going to be going on. Revelation 15.1 says this, Then I saw another sign in the heaven, great and marvelous, and seven angels who had seven plagues, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. That's what we're going to see. The wrath of God is finished. Now, when we were back in chapter 15, this was a parenthetical. It was kind of laying out the events are going to happen. But now these events are happening, and they will happen in that tribulation. The world says, no, they won't. God's love, and he's just going to turn his back. He's just going to let me in. I would not want to trust in that view. I don't want any of my family, my friends. And if someone would choose to be an enemy, I don't want anyone to go through that. And we're going to see God doesn't want anyone to go through that. Now, these seven bowls can be compared to the seven trumpets. Now, When we went through the seven trumpets, it dealt with the earth. The seven bowls is going to deal with the earth. Then it dealt with the sea and the trumpets, and we see the sea is going to be dealt with as we go through in verse 3, and then the rivers and the springs, and and we'll see that the same thing in verses 4 and 5 today. And the sun and the moon and the stars, and see, he starts with this, this, again, trying to get their attention, trying to wake them up, shake them up. 
You want a taste of what hell's going to be like? This is what it's like. But this is nothing compared to what's going to happen. Everything that follows those trumpets here is magnified. And again, it's beyond comprehension. How could a God of love do this? He must deal with sin. We'll talk about that when we get that. Well, begin with me in verse 1. There we begin with the six bowls of the wrath. He says, then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying that the seven angels go and pour out on the earth seven bowls of wrath of God. The temple is not the earthly temple. This is the heavenly temple. God is speaking from heaven. One day you will hear God's voice clearly as you hear my voice now. We hear impressions in our hearts and God, we, we hear him speak through the word, but it's not the same as hearing someone speak. These angels are, are commanded what they're doing. Say to the seven angels, each one is responsible for pouring out this wrath. God's wrath go and pour out upon the earth. And again, the Greek stresses, again, the, the loudness of, of the voice. This is what John's stressing, the loud, and he's, he's stressing the intense, it is an intense moment. You ever been in a situation, you walk in a room and it's just like, man, it's tense. You don't know what's going on. Everyone's quiet, has a look, there's a feeling. Again, this is going to be beyond anything that you and I can imagine. Now, in Isaiah 66, 6, it says this, the, the, a voice of uproar from the city, a voice from the temple, the voice of the Lord who is rendering recompense to his enemy. Now, if you're a believer today, you're born again. Before you came to become a believer, you were an enemy of God. That's what Ephesians tells us. Chapter 2, before you're saved, you are an enemy of God. So what he's talking about is those who have said, for me and my house, we will not serve the Lord, but we will serve ourselves. Look around. That's what the world view is. Self-serving. It's all about themselves, about me, they would say. They're unrepentant. God offers them life, life abundant, but they reject it. John's ears are sounded majestic because of this voice of God. I, I think that the first time that I hear my, my little grandson, that I'm looking for that, he, he call, they call me Zadie. That's grandpa in, in Yiddish. I'm, I'm yearning, listening for that. It might be for you. You remember when your child said, Mama or Daddy, and how exciting that was. I'm longing to hear God call out to me personally. Aren't you? Yes. What excitement for that to be, and that day is coming for us. That is the believers. See, this voice is coming from the holy of holies, the place that God said he would meet us. Where did he say he'd meet us? Upon that mercy seat. Anyone need mercy today? I need mercy. And that's where he said he wants to meet you and me. But the choice is yours. Will you receive his mercy and grace freely given? All you need to do is believe and trust in him and look to him. He will empower you to walk in his ways. You become his workmanship, and one day he will finish that work in you. And then he'll usher you into the presence, Jesus, into the presence of Father. Father, look, look, look what I've done in this individual and that individual. In this life, I don't want anybody bragging about me. Why? Because I know I'm going to let them down. Isn't that true in you too? Because none of us can, we don't all have it together. None of us have it together, no matter what you and I think. But one day God will finish the work in his believers and we will be caught up to be with him forever in heaven. When we get to chapter 21, what a wonderful That'd be, I, I looked this morning, that'd be the last week of May. How exciting you and I will be in heaven. So he says, go and pour forth on the earth the seven bowls, the wrath of God. The command, it's direct and to the point, it's going to happen. 
They must go forth, pour out God's wrath. That's what they're called to do. Revelation 16, 2 says this. So the first angel went out and poured out the bowl upon the earth, and it became loathsome, malignant sores on the people who had noticed the mark of the beast who worshipped his image. See, this mark, first of all, is going to be directed to those who have taken the mark of the beast. The Antichrist, Satan. And this begins dealing with them. Notice again, that first trumpet affects not all the people, but a select group of people who are unrepentant. The first bowl here, the, the people who suffer with festering boils. I'm not going to ask you whether you had boils. I've had boils when I was young. They are not nice. They're horrible. They're painful, and they're going to have them all over their body. And it's clearly directed, again, to a certain group of people. The, now, that word sore they use is ulcerated, inflamed, oozing. That, that sounds real good, doesn't it? But it gives you the picture. This, this is a horrible place. This is what the world is going to, to go through. Those have taken the mark of the beast. You know, I've heard people say, yeah, I'll take the mark. It's no problem. Because we know we can save ourselves. God's love. He's going to save me. And they have no idea what they're saying. It's not the first time this has happened. If you go back again to the book of Exodus, again, we, we know the same thing on a, on a, a very minor situation compared to Again, in Egypt happened, the sixth plague. You remember there's Lazarus, the story of Lazarus. He's in Abraham's bosom. And while he was alive, he had all these sores oozing, but he's comforted in heaven. This is a, a judgment, though, upon the repentant, unrepentant. Let me read from Revelation 14, verse 9 through 11. Another angel a third one followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead and on his hand, he will also drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed, notice, full strength in the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented again with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb, which is Jesus Christ, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and there be no rest day or night, and those who worship the beast and their image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Prophesied, everyone's aware, everyone's without excuse. Romans chapter 1 tells it, every person in this world is without excuse. God's instilled in their heart there is a God. What will you do with that knowledge? That's really what it boils down to. If you're not a, a believer today, you have a decision to make. The most important decision you'll ever, ever make in your life. You'll either receive Jesus Christ or you will reject him. And you will suffer the consequences of everything that's in here. Now, in the church, many people, and I'll mention this, it's fitting here, believe that as I use that term remnant, there's only a remnant say, there's only a remnant in the church. If there was a church of a thousand people, many believe that maybe only 25% are saved. So if there's a thousand people, 250 are saved and 750 are going to hell because they're still trusting in their works. They're trusting in what they can do. They're trusting that they come to church, they give or whatever. I, I sing to him. What God wants is a relationship with you. He wants your heart. He wants to teach you how to love him with all your heart and mind and soul and strength. And the second is, is to love your neighbor as yourself. That's the two commands. Everything else hinges upon that, love. Again, he poured out his bowl upon the earth and it becomes loathsome, malignant source. First of all, the earth, which brings forth its food, mankind, and all the judgments that have been coming. <laughs> food is short. We talked about when we went through Ezekiel, oil, gas, 
everything's short. One by one, God is just chiseling away at man's arrogant pride. We're going to see in a moment, God finds no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked, but his goal is to, look, come to him. Repent. But they won't. If a person can't repent today, they will not repent then because their hearts are already hardened. It becomes evident when the people consume the produce of the earth and suffer the ulcers and and all the things on the outside of their body, their health is affected by the food they ingest, stricken, disease. Everything goes on and on and on. Who has the mark of the beast and worships the image. It's interesting, only the Antichrist forces that to follow the beast. Those that follow him will be stricken, not not followers of Christ. God doesn't pour wrath upon his own. And the church will not be there during the tribulations we've looked at when we look back at Revelation 4 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and and also in uh, 1 Timothy. And then we looked also in... uh, 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 15, all the passages. And if you want to know who goes through the tribulation, look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It says, us and them, us and them, who will go through and who will not. And we need to check our hearts. Are we right with God? Look with me in verse 3, and it says, The second angel poured out a bowl upon the sea, and it became blood-like, that of a dead man, and every living thing, and the sea died. Whereas the second trumpet judgment, one-third of the salt water was affected. Here, the second bowl of judgment is the rest of the sea, turned into blood, destroying every living creature and the sea. There's an argument, a debate, I should say, uh, between many. Some say it's just the Mediterranean Sea. Some say it's all the seas of the world. Well, pan theory. For those who don't know the pan theory, we'll see how it pans out when that time comes. It really doesn't matter. It's going to happen. It's more than you have to understand These judgments are not just in Israel. These judgments are the world. So to me, it's the whole world. Every sea, ocean, everywhere, everyone will suffer for taking the mark of the beast. This will wipe out the the fishing industry. Sorry there. Okay. And, And diminish the food supplies around the world in many ways. I don't know if you've ever seen blood tide. There's a stench. It's horrible. Beaches are covered with dead. It's going to be much worse than that. The red tide kills fishes, poisons. Those that eat uh, the contaminated shellfish, it just goes on and on. The red tide hit the coast of Florida in 1949. The water first turned yellow, and then in midsummer it was thick. And countless billions of tiny one-cell organisms filled the sea. The marine life affected by this algae was totally wiped out at that time. And this will be worldwide. Any volunteers to go through the tribulation? I hope not. But some people are very confident and very arrogant. Pride comes before what? A fall. Please. Please don't tempt the Lord. Some commentators, again, hint, again, it's just the Mediterranean. But, you know, we'll see how it pans out. The fact is, I see God judging the whole world. And it's going to happen. Look at verse 4 with me. And then the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers, the springs of waters, and they became blood. 
The things that are impossible for you and me to do are possible for God. God will turn the water, not into wine this time, but into blood. You and I know that from Leviticus, Deuteronomy, the life is in the blood. And here it's a reverse. It's a curse on those. This, again, is, is going to affect the whole world. It will, again, affect the wells and cisterns. Some say uh, some will not be affected. But that water comes from the same water table. Again, we'll see how that pans out. It's not unlike what has happened in Exodus chapter 7, verse 19. It said this, Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take off your staff, stretch it out over the waters of Egypt and over the rivers and over the streams and over the pools and over the reservoirs of water, that they may become blood. And there will be blood throughout the land of Egypt, both in vessels, notice, of wood and vessels of stone. All these were kind of like shadows and signs of what God's going to do, but man wouldn't repent. If you remember again, Pharaoh recognized several times this is the hand of God, and he hardened his heart to God. And what did God do next? God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Every one of these judgments come, man's heart is going to get harder, and there's a point that God says, okay, if you don't want to believe then I'll harden your heart. You don't have to believe. I won't force you to believe. I've given you free will. But only because that's what man chooses. We sang that song, Choose Whom You Will Serve Today. Whom will you serve? And it's something you need to reevaluate regularly. Are you serving yourself or are you serving God? The people who experienced the plague are like those in Egypt that went through, but on a much larger scale. The plague differs from the preceding one because human beings and animal world daily depend upon that water. Can you imagine if, if all the water, the wells, you turn on your faucet and blood's coming out? How long can you go without water? How long? We already turn on our water. And our water is polluted many times. I remember when I was a nurseryman many years ago, I'd bought this property. We had greenhouses in the back. And I hooked up an uh, injector. I was injecting bromine into the water to control the algae and everything. And my daughter was young probably under two at the time. I test, and, and I would measure the level of bromine. And one time I happened to go in the house and test it because our house was on the property. And I realized that somehow somebody had connected a pipe into our house. And it was pink coming out the faucet. And certainly, she's fine. <laughs> We're fine. But that was just me. Somebody had connected the pipes before we bought that. We had no idea. We ran all the new pipes and did everything. And yet you know that you're drinking polluted water so, so much. And Hawaii, water in Hawaii is much better than it is in other places in the world. I'm thankful for that. But this will be blood, unfit to drink. People will eventually die of thirst. Look with me in verse 5. It says, I heard an angel. Notice it says an angel of the water saying, Righteous are you who are, who were, O holy one, because you have judged these things, for they have poured out the blood of the saints, the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, and they deserve it. Wow. See, these that he's talking about have slayed the blood of the saints. 
all who desire to live godly will be persecuted. Well, that's okay. You'll suffer persecution. But what we're talking about, this most likely, but not necessarily, are all those that have been persecuted through the tribulation. But the key is, is it's the saints. This is the reason why these judgments are coming. God will vindicate, not only vindicate you in the end. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I love those verses. If somebody punches me or hurts me now, I don't have to, to seek revenge. I don't have to try and destroy them. God's going to deal with them, and yet my prayer should be, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do, and pray that they come to their senses. Recently, someone came up to me I dealt with 18 years ago, and he came up, and afterwards, uh, he I don't know if I ever apologized to you. He goes on to describe what a jerk he was. I put it in polite words. So he confesses, and now he's telling me how his life has changed. And that's our hope, isn't it, that people will change? That those that persecute us will come to those senses? That's, that's the God we know. He, he's just waiting patiently, long-suffering, wishing that none would perish, giving him every opportunity. We may suffer because of that. But can you imagine that when you get to heaven, seeing people that you never thought would get there got there? What a joy that would be. It will all be worth it. Leon Morris comments on this passage. He, he says, the angels of water sees the things proceeding as an excellent example of making punishment fit to the crime. See, they shed the blood. These were martyrs that's talking about. Now they have to drink the blood fitting for the crime. That's what you and I want. But God's judgment is always righteous. When we want judgment, we want vengeance. It's totally different. God's still wanting them, as long as they're alive, to come to their senses. And that should be our prayer. Deuteronomy 32, 4 says this, the rock, his work is perfect for all of his ways are just, a God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteousness and upright is he. See, when we worship him, we worship him. All these qualities, we, we can rejoice and know that when that time comes, people have Chosen death, chosen hell. The choice is theirs. God won't force them. Now, God's holiness tolerates no, ultimately, no unrighteousness. His judgments are always right, always just, always fair. Now, the saints who confess their sins receive grace. I don't care what you've done in your past. If you acknowledge your sinfulness and need of a Savior, and you come to him with a true and pure heart, say, God, save me. He will save you. He will forgive you and separate your sins as far as the east from the west. Who is like our God? That's not something a human being will do. He separates them as far as these. That means he chooses never to remember the sin. Anyone ever wrong you and, and are you still brewing on it? Some people still are. But God chooses not to remember. How wonderful is our God? And his judgment, when he finally judges, he, he's exhausted all of these things. And they say, no. No, God. I don't want life. For the saints, they'll receive grace. For the unbeliever, they will receive judgment simply because they will not repent.
Now note the word blood is mentioned twice. It's spilt of those who had persecuted again by the followers of the Antichrist. The blood is used again for the rivers and the springs that God had made the persecutors drink. Drinking blood, gosh, that's abhorrent. And no believer does that, but Satan does. It's kind of reflecting, this is what you're doing. This is your consequences. And certainly, I don't believe it's literal. It's a cup of wrath. I believe it's figuratively they're going to suffer is what I really believe it means because no one's going to drink blood unless you are a Satanist. But it's going to suffer the wrath of God, a death, eternal separation, a life of misery all their life. Isaiah 49, 26 says this, I will feed your oppressors with their own flesh and will become drunk with their own blood as with sweet wine. And all the flesh will know that I am the Lord, am your Savior, your Redeemer, your Mighty One of Jacob. Drunk with their own blood is not meaning they're drinking the blood, but, but, but they're drunk on killing people, murdering people. God's letting them have their own way, and they will experience the judgment all mankind will know. God's deliverance of Israel will be so dramatic in the world and will recognize the Lord and Savior, many, Redeemer, the Mighty One of Israel, is the true God. There will, be, there will be those that come to that saving knowledge, but it is only a remnant. Now the blood of the saints. There's many kinds of saints. So this could actually include Old Testament saints, those who had been martyred in the Old Testament by the, by the religious leaders, any of the New Testament saints are those that are tribulation saints. Saints, what are saints? Any saints here today? Hold your hand up if you're a saint. That means you're set apart for God's glory, a vessel of honor. It doesn't mean you're holy any better than anyone else. It means you have called upon the name of the Lord and you have been set apart. You are now his workmanship. And it doesn't mean just, again, just church saints. It could be Old Testament saints, sanctified, being holy. Sometimes the, the meaning and the context is holy ones are faithful ones. If you're faithful today in the Lord, it's because God makes you faithful. You cannot do it on your own power. Apart from him, you can do nothing that is good. What is a saint in a simple term? Saints are brothers. When someone stumbles, you pick them up. You don't kick them when they're down. You see one another as, as part of the same family, even though they're growing and maturing. They're still stumbling, but they're growing. They're, they're my brother, my sister. We bear one another's burdens. That's what brothers do. That's what saints do. We bear each other's burdens. We're bestower. We bestow the word of God upon people. We, we give it away. Saints are benefactors. We receive, again, blessings for what we do by giving ourselves to the Lord and then giving ourselves to others and bringing the word of God. We will stand at that beam of seat and be rewarded for the opportunities that God has given us. And in fact, he's done that work in us that we can be available and he works through us. Saints are beacons. We're a light unto the world. We shine the light of the love of Jesus Christ. Saints are a benefit. What I mean by that is wherever you go, we should be a blessing. People should be excited when we come into the room, blessed by our presence, encouraged by our presence. If someone's fallen, we pick them up. We encourage them. We don't tear them down. We don't judge them. 
These are the believers. Look with me at verse 7. It says, and I heard, I heard the altar saying, Yes, O Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. There's never a question upon God's fairness if you know him. If you're in the word, you're, you're reading the word, you see it. Saint after saint talks about knowing when they sinned, God has restored them, taken away the sins. Those that talk about God as unfair and unjust have never really read, never come into a relationship with them. Let me read from Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God, because of the testimony which he had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging the blood of those who dwell upon the earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe, speaking of salvation. And they were told that they should rest a little longer until the number of the fellow servants and then their brethren who were killed even as they had been would be completed also they know we know that many have been treated in this world unjustly I look at the, the holocaust I, I even look at again the Christians have killed people in the name of Jesus that, that's not Christianity but God will deal with that He's patient, he's long-suffering, giving every person a chance. He certainly has given you a chance, hasn't he? He's given me a chance, saved late in life. Revelation 16, verse 8 says, For the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun and given to scorch men with fire, and men will be scorched with fierce heat. And they blaspheme the name of God, who has the power over the plagues. And they did not repent so as to give him the glory. That, that phrase is the same thing that you find back in the book of Exodus. Pharaoh would not give God the glory. You know one of the ways that you give God the glory is confess your sins. God, I was wrong. Get honest with God. He already knows. But admit your sin. Admit your need of him. The fourth trumpet judge affected the sun, destroying one-third of the, the light source. It's all gone. But the fourth bowl judgment in this case affected the sun increasing in, in temperature, suffering severe sunburn, solar radiation. Can you imagine trying to go to 7-Eleven see if you can find sunglasses or some kind of lotion? There's not going to be anything, and that's not going to do any good. Aren't you glad the church is not here during that period of time? Well, you're escapist. No, you're not escapist. God has just brought you to himself. You've fulfilled your purpose. He's taking you home. Well, again, the, the, the time is going to be difficult. Water sources have been corrupted by the blood. Demand for medicinal creams to, to protect the sun. It's interesting when you think about it, there's an old saying that the, the same, again, sun, the same heat or sun that softens, again, the wax hardens the clay. God's goal is to bring people back, soften but they've already decided they would not believe. You know, there's no need in talking to anybody if you say, well, if I can show you that Jesus Christ is, is God in the flesh and he's, he's died for the sins of the world, he's resurrected, I can show you, it, it, whether it be in the Bible or in secular history, I can show you these. And they say they will not believe. Well, it's the end of the conversation. They've already decided they would not believe. That's what we're talking about here. These are the ones that are judging Mankind understood well that the source, notice, was God. God was given him every chance to repent. I look back at my life, all those years apart from God. God was so patient. I'm so thankful he didn't come back. 
during that time that I was not walking with the Lord. And our hope and our prayer is that many would come to it before it even gets to this point. But instead of turning to them, what do they do? They blaspheme God. Let me read from Isaiah 24, verse 6. It says, therefore, a curse devours the earth, and those who live in it are held guilty. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned. And few people are left. See, all these things that we're talking about in the book of Revelation, they're already in the Old Testament, some in the New Testament. It's just a culmination of these prophecies bringing them together. Be easily traced back. And then there's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6, for those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, he scourges every son whom he receives. I'm thankful for discipline. I think all of us have probably needed to go to the spiritual woodshed from time to time and get us back on that right course, get our eyes where they need to be. But the verse I love so much is Ezekiel 33, verse 11. Look, it says, Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked would turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why then will you die, O house of Israel? Now he's talking about Israel here in, in their backslidden place. But this is the heart of God. God finds no pleasure on anyone who is evil. Evil are those who are unrepentant, like darkness more than light. Choose to do it their own way. Patient, long-suffering, finds no pleasure in it. Once upon a time, this, I was young, and this, this kid, he just was a bully, just bullied everybody. And one day, my dad didn't know what he was saying. Sometimes, son, you have to just stand up for your rights, and there's a time and a place, and he didn't know what he was saying. And that day, I stood up and pounded that bully in the ground. But it didn't stop. The next day I pounded him, pounded him, pounded him every day I got until I went into the principal's office and got in trouble. But isn't that how, yeah, I became the bully and I didn't know. But see, we went went with revenge. We wanted on our own terms. We like being there getting even. It grieves my heart now. Sometimes adults still act the same way as I did when I was a kid. God wants to set us free. Joshua 24, 15 says this. If it's disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose yourself today whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers serve, which are beyond the river, the gods of the Amorites, whose land you're living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We really need to reevaluate these things regularly. Who are we serving? If we're honest, and you say, well, you're strong, but that's the nature of man. It's so easy. Someone to hurt you, mock you, want to get even with them. Look with me in verse 10 of our text. It says, in the, the fifth angel poured out his bowl, and on the throne of the beast, and the kingdom became darkness, and gnawed, and bit, and chew, and the tongue because of the pain, and they blasphemed the God of heaven and because of the pains and their sorrows and they did not repent of their deeds again you compare the, the trumpets against the bowls and you see the, the common thing God's given this is what's going to happen is this really what you want there's always warning before there's wrath fifth plague affects the again the throne of the beast not directed at the world but the, the throne of the beast Namely, the seat of the, the spiritual uh, empire directed directly at that. The last three plagues are a series of seven. Affecting just the followers of, of Satan. And it's so important to understand that God has been patient. Every new judgment that occurs merely further hardens the heart of man. The older you get, and you have not received the Lord, the harder it is going to be to receive him. 
that's why we need to get, get the information out to kids and in our family and our friends because it, it's going to be harder to acknowledge. Not to say it won't happen. It can't happen. But man is hardening his heart. Look with me in verse 12. And then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. Its water was dried up so that the way would be prepared for the kings of the east. We talked a little bit about this when we were in Ezekiel 38. They're going to cross this dry river. We know when the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, they crossed on dry ground. We know when they came into the promised land, they crossed the Jordan, they crossed on dry ground. Shouldn't surprise us. But this Euphrates, is, it's a great river if you notice. It's huge. The Nile is nothing compared to what this is here. We'll talk more about that next week when we talk about Babylon and, and, and the significance of that river. It affects it. Uh, Euphrates is no normal river. But look, notice here, especially you guessed, when I do this, this is my opinion. I think this is, I'm going to insert something in here. I, anyone think Noah's Ark's been found? Oh, they say it's found, not found, and they argue all the time. I think if it's ever going to be found, this is going to be the time the water again of the Euphrates for it to dry up. God could part it in one spot, but it comes from the very place where the, the ark is to be. I kind of wondered, this is my opinion, when, when all the armies are going to battle in Jezreel, they're going to look up, oh, there's Noah's ark. That wasn't a story, but we're going to battle against God. Everything that God is doing that's revealing that he is faithful and true and he, he is right. The world knows that these things are supposed to happen. They pretend they don't. They're already making excuses for them. Look with me in verse 13 of our text. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are the spirits of demons performing signs, which go out to the kings of the world to gather them together for war on that great day of God, that almighty this is the final battle that's in Jezreel. When that battle goes on, the blood is supposed to ride up to the bridles of the horses. There's not going to be missiles going in there as we talked about. We looked at Ezekiel, because one of the biggest oil finds it there. And if, if now oil, natural oil, gas, food, it's, it's a shortage. They're not going to go blowing it up. They're going to gather just as the scripture says. So we see the demonic activity, and many believe it's increasing now in this world. It will increase during the tribulation. Satan's last chance. Another reason I don't want to be here. I want nothing to do with Satan. Notice they're doing false signs, performing signs. Notice to lead or deceive the kings of the world. Satan's a deceiver from the beginning. He's a liar from the beginning. It's so interesting that people follow people in sin, follow people that are liars, people that, that cause division. It reveals they're really like-minded and their hearts are hardened to the truth. Verse 15 says, Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Be blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. And they will be gathered together in the place in Hebrew called Armageddon or Armageddon, depending on your translation, how they word it. All these things are setting up for that final battle that's coming. You've all heard about it. The news even talks about it, but they kind of laugh and mock at it oftentimes. God does not lie. God has spoken. It will happen. The only ones that will be there in that world are those that, again, have not repented of their sin. 
That's why it's so important to make a, a decision today. Now, all these things, they're, they're, they're setting up for the next event. Uh, again, the, that campaign of Armageddon I just mentioned, but also the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, again, there was a first coming when he came to earth. God incarnate, God in flesh, tabernacled among us. And then he's going to come for the church. We mentioned again in Revelation 4, I mentioned that we'll be caught up to be with him. We'll be caught up to be with him in the clouds. But when he comes in the second coming, we'll be coming back with him. He'll be coming back in judgment. Because God's holy, he must judge sin. When I was young, I kind of, yeah, yeah, I got a long life to go. I don't need to worry about this right now. You don't know whether you have another day, another moment. I shared a long time ago of a guy who was on the radio in, in Los Angeles, and he was saying something along that line. You don't know. You have a, another, another day, another moment. He got in his car off his shift. He was a ra- on the radio saying this, going down the uh, freeway in California. He was in an accident, and he was killed. They announced it on the radio that day. It was on the news and TV and everything. Many people come to the saving knowledge because they recognize, yeah, he, he didn't know. I don't know either. You don't know. I've heard so many stories. I heard one today of a, a person got saved and a month later, dead from an accident. You don't know the day that God will call you home. You need to have your house in order. Be ready to meet him. Because when that happens, it's too late. Isaiah 44, 27, taking you back. It it is I who says to the depth of the sea, be dried up. And I will make the rivers dry up. When the children of Israel crossed into the promised land... The, the priests, they were to wait till they see the moving of the Ark of the Covenant, till they saw God moving is the idea. The Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God. In the moment when they, they saw the Ark moving and the feet, their feet touched the water, the water parted. But you know, the water had already stopped 15 miles upstream. God is already working today. Now, no one knows the hour or the time. I don't know. He, it, it could go another 50 years. I don't see how doesn't matter. I know I'm going to be with him soon just because of my age or maybe an accident. I don't know. The seventh bowl. I'll deal with very lightly because I tie this in with, again, next week's message. The seventh bowl, verse 17, the angel poured out the bowl upon the air and a loud voice came out of the temple and from the throne. It is done. Can you imagine what those last three words are going to be like? It is done. God's wrath is poured out. It's complete. It will happen. That moment's coming. This is why we say, make sure your house is in order. God's wrath, this is what, again, so many people have been looking for is sin is finally judged that we will finally go to heaven at one point and we will be with the Lord forever. No more sin, no pain, no sorrow, no temptations. The best is yet to come. It's horrible what happens. An awful earthquake, the worst that the world has ever seen. Follow with me. The final verses, and there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and a great earthquake, such as there has not been since man came to be upon the earth. So great the earthquake was, so mighty. This is beyond anything. You know, the Richter scale, I don't know. It's not a 7, it's not an 8, it's not a 10. Maybe it's a 20, maybe it's a 50. It splits, again, that area in three parts. Follow with me. The great city was split in three parts. The city of the nations fell. Babylon, the great, was remembered before God to give her cup a wine of fierce wrath. Every island 
fled away. That means these islands, when that final event comes, like all the rest of the islands, they disappear, sucked into the ocean, beyond. Anyone want to be here? I don't. As it goes on, the mountains were not found. Huge hailstones, about 100 pounds each, came down from heaven on earth. Men blasphemed God because of the plague. Their hall because of the plague. It was extremely severe. God's wrath is now complete. Who experiences it? First, the, the sinners that have hardened their hearts. They've rejected God's warning. They refuse to repent. Even the curse that came from, from heaven, they rejected, the, again, what God had said. Four verses, and I'm pow. Listen to these, because these are the people that will suffer the wrath of God. Revelation 9.21 and they did not repent of their murders, nor their sorceries, their immorality, nor their thefts. Revelation 16, 9, men were scorched with fierce heat. They blasphemed the name of God who has the power over these plagues. They did not repent so as to give him the glory. All oh, powerful God is. And then Revelation 16, 11, and they blasphemed God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. God was allowing these things to happen for them to just repent. Won't you come to your senses? They knew it was God, but they chose not to repent. And finally, in Revelation 16, 7, and I heard the altar saying, yes, O Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. God is merciful, gracious, loving, kind. His mercies are new every morning. The world needs to call upon this God. They need to know him because, again, this world is out of control. You know when you look at the news. It's only a matter of time. What time? I don't know. But unless they repent... They will experience this. Father, thank you for revealing your righteous, holy judgment. Why we cannot understand completely in our finite minds, we know you're holy and righteous, pure and just. We know you must judge sin because you are a holy God. Father, have your way in our hearts. Use us for your glory. Send us into this world to share your loving gospel, the good news of what you have done for those that will call upon your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand for closing song?
justice all will be new your name forever faithful and true Jesus is coming soon like a bride waiting for her groom we'll be a church waiting for you every heart longing for our king we sing even so come lord jesus come even so come lord jesus come so we You're coming soon So we wait We wait for you God, we wait You're coming soon Like a bride waiting for her groom will be a church ready for you every heart longing for our king we sing even so come lord jesus come even so come lord jesus Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the message that we've heard today, and may we apply it to our lives, repent of our sins, and come to you and enable you and allow you to make us into the people you want us to be. And now, in the closing of the book of Jude, written by Jesus' half-brother Jude, verses 24 and 25, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. If any of you would like to have a prayer uh, with somebody, please uh, let us know. See me or Juan, Ed, Adolfo, or Pastor Ron. Thank you.